Before we begin, thank you very much to Tim A. for joining the Patreon campaign. Always appreciated. Thank you very much for the support. So, we are almost at the end of the month, so I'll give you a reminder. It is almost time for the monthly Q&A. If you want to get something answered, then please go to my previous Q&A video. Leave your question in the comments there. Uh, remember, keep it to one question per post and try to keep it to something simple that we can just kind of rattle off and get straight through. Nothing that's going to take like an entire video to explain, right? So just keep it nice and simple. Just keep the question, you know, kind of fun, you know, and we'll, we'll, we'll just have a good time with it. So thank you everyone who's been uh, throwing in things for that. We have something interesting today. So every time I think I'm done with Beast Machines, we got to do something else and we got to talk about it again. But you know what? It's an interesting time in Transformer history. So it's not a bad thing to check in on once in a while. So this was provided to our friends at TFRaw.com by a Twitter user, 20th Dan. And these are just a small sampling of what was provided. This is the original concept draft for Beast Machines back when it was known as Beast Hunters. So what you're seeing for is the very first treatment, the very first pitch that was thrown at the executives in charge as to what they wanted to do with the show next. Now... There were a few documents, including an entire show Bible, and we will be covering that at some point. For now, since this is the original pitch, I thought this would be the first place to go, and I thought this would be a natural start to such an exploration. So, for starters, I'm going to spare you the initial like summary pitch here. You can go read that for yourself. I will, before we get into the actual story pitch for Season 1, uh, let's go down to the character roster. Uh, because the de the descriptions of them are actually kind of interesting. So, for starters, we have Optimus Primal, an 800-pound gorilla in beast form. In robotic form, he is a gray and purple humanoid with jets. Okay, so he's kind of like gold and, cold and blue and mostly gray, but, you know, like, differences. Uh, weaponry is where it gets interesting. Mini double-barreled missile launcher in the left forearm. Mega missile launchers that are shoulder-mounted and dual ninja-style sonic swords. Hmm. Now, doesn't that sound interesting? Because that's not Beast Machine's Optimus Primal. Having weapons at all is not Beast Machine's Optimus Primal. If we go down here to Cheetor, it mentions a blue and orange humanoid, which is not quite correct for his Beast Machine's appearance. Uh, it also mentions his Quasar Cannon, also known as a Gut Gun. This is Season 1. They're describing Season 1 characters. Here's Rat Trap. Uh, yeah, golden gray humanoid. Which, by the way, 5 foot gray and brown rat. So, we actually have like a size scale for Transformers now. Uh, Fusion Pistol. Like, yeah, that's a standard pistol. Uh, giant Black Widow Spider. Black and gold humanoid. That's Season 1 Black Arachnia. So, it's interesting. The fact that it mentions things like the gut gun makes me think that the original incarnations for these characters were almost conceived to be their Season 1 designs. But then again, Primal is listed as gray and purple, which would have indicated some kind of change. Now, that's not the only one mentioned, though, because we also have Megatron, still described as a Predacon, not a Viacon, uh, as a dragon, but still black and and purple in coloration so season one colors but season three design which kind of would have sounded like a really cool color scheme not gonna lie that's interesting to me uh so it's 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 fascinating that there's so many like season one throwbacks like they're always going to go back to basics even though that is like the farthest departure from what exactly they did uh, that does mention henchmen below. And the henchmen, the Viacons, are pretty much standard to what they ended up being. So we have, like, Skybolt, which is uh, Jetstorm's original name. Um, so when they switched the idea, because if you look down here, if we look down to Thrust, it mentions he has a tiny bit of maximal spark still inside him and allows him to instinctively care for Black Arachnia. So the original concept was for that red herring to not be a red herring. Thrust was going to be Silverbolt. Um, when they decided to switch it to the aerial member of the team, uh, they switched out Skybolt's name because they thought that would be too much of a giveaway. Thus, we got Jetstorm. 
Uh, the detailed descriptions uh, for Sky Bolt are the same. Top Gun pilot gone to the dark side. That's not a bad descriptor for Jet for, for Jetstorm. Uh, Tankor is seems to be a little bit more threatening. Uh, so let's see. See, he's nearly impenetrable. Tankor's near mindless berserker only exists to crush everything under his tread. So I wouldn't describe Tankor and Beast Machines as a berserker. He's just a big dumb lug. Um, see, but he also believes Megatron and the others are simply too weak. If they were strong, they should have defeated Optimus the Maximals ages ago. Tankor is not bright, but he's crafty and evil, and even Megatron has to watch his back. So, the original pitch for Tankor was for him to be treacherous and power-hungry, even though he was dumb as a brick. That's interesting. So, this is like putting in the, the, the Rhinox part of him, the evil Rhinox part of him, before they even had that concept in mind. There's also a whole section here at the bottom about, like, incorporating humor, uh, which we know uh, didn't exactly happen much in Beast Machine Season 1. So I think there's, a, I think they kind of, like, they might have, like, accidentally cut that from the whole rundown. All right, so already you can tell this was very different in what they imagined it was going to be. Imagine, 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 imagine. So... Uh, let's go into it. I'm just gonna read you this and give my, give you my thoughts as we go. It's only a few pages. We'll see. Uh, we'll see how long this actually takes me. Um, let's see. So um, let's see. Primal Black Arch here. Four maximal robots can transform between robot and animal. Return to Cybertron after a long, fruitless journey to find other Transformer races. So this describes a completely different tone. I mean, that's. I mean, you could assume that might have been, like, the original mission of the Axelon, but that was never mentioned. It almost makes it sound like that they returned to Cybertron and then left again. You know, um, which would be an odd choice. Uh, but the basic is, uh, remains the same. Megatron's troops appear, the planet's wiped out, etc. What's interesting about this is it describes a lot of interactions with the Viacon generals before they even run into the Oracle. So the generals would have been a thing from the get-go, With, uh, if I remember reading this right, with Tankor being one that comes along later, and it's only Skybolt and Thrust that they find themselves dealing with. But Thrust is already like showing uh, implications of connection to Black Arachnia, before we even get to the descriptions of uh, the like any anything approaching a reformatting, uh, we have minor changes here. Uh, Megatropolis, not Cybertropolis, uh, as the Megatron's impenetrable fortress. Um, let's see what else do we have here? There's also interesting details that didn't get mixed in. So it mentions things like great sports domes uh, flying above the cities. Uh, Transformers may be robots, but they are also all too much like human beings. They care, they desire, they eat, and they enjoy fun and sports. Which, again, never actually made it into the show itself. Cybertron is a very grim, dismal image of what it used to be. No indication that there was anything besides war on the planet. Alright, let me move through here. Um, they mentioned, there's another note about, uh, there's another m mention about adding humor which I thought was not something that was in there. Uh, it does mention him, like, teasing Black Arachnia over the connection to Thrust, which, again, I don't think really happened in the series. Nothing I can remember, not, like, extreme teasing. All right. Uh, there's a weird part here, because they do get the, like, the, the, tra the, the transformation virus thing is a thing in this original concept. Uh, see, the Maximals panic. Unless they can transform, they will still go, soon go into stasis lock, which causes a transformer to completely shut down. Remember, this is a pitch for a bunch of white-haired people in boardrooms, so they probably have zero idea as to what a transformer is, what stasis lock is. They probably have no context of Beast Wars. This, so this has to be presented in very simple context. Uh, if the stasis lock continues for too long, the Transformers cannot be revived and its spark dies. Transformation is the Transformers equivalent of breathing. No, it's not. No, it's never been. We know from Beast Wars Season 1 that they can survive in beast mode for days at a time without ever having to transform. Tigatron likely spent weeks at a time in beast mode without ever going into stasis lock. Uh, so this is a really weird, like, this, like, the ori this original pitch 
seems to lack some basic understanding of what ha of uh, Beast Wars logic. Let's see. Da, 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 da. Let's see, we'll grow. Let's see, uh, transformation opens them up to change. Otherwise, as machines, they'll grow stagnant and die as a race. To transform is the core of what they are, and without it, they seems to be in every way possible. Which is an interesting take when we have things like Jawbreaker in Earthspark, who has had to learn that an alt mode does not define you. So, a very different style of writing back in 1999. All right, let's see. Let's see what else we have here. So. Uh, there is mention of like the, the the they call them henchmen. They have not been named Viacons in this script, uh, but they do mention that they are far more tactical and more cunning in battle, and that they seem to be capable of countering just about anything the Maximals do because they're pulling from their maximal experience of their original sparks. So it's uh, definitely not something we got. We got that in season two when they finally ramped up the threat level of the Viacons. We did not really get that in season one. Uh, it also, this original draft goes back and forth between Black Arachnia and Thrust and Black Arachnia and Skybolt. So it's almost as if they weren't sure which one was actually going to end up being Silverbolt in the, in the process. Obviously we know what the original, the eventual outcome was, but we do have a, a little bit of confusion when you read through it. Also, it mentions that Cheetor still cares about Black Arachnids, and, uh, he, and there's some jealousy towards Skybolt over his, you know, his connection to Black Arachnia. So the crush from Season 3 Beast Wars was going to be maintained, and there was going to be some animosity there. So that was that's another one that didn't uh, happen. Okay, here's another fun one. Uh, so a lot of, originally this seems to be um, originally this seems to be Black Arachnia doing a lot of the exploring. It's Rat Trap and Black Arachnia doing a lot of catacomb exploring. And it seems like it was Black Arachnia who actually first discovered Oracom. Not the Oracle, Oracom. Uh, sci I mean, and, uh, again, it is, it does see Optimus as a receptive spark. In this case, describing him as having the Matrix. Remember, we, we, in Beast Wars writing logic, having the Matrix just means that your spark is connected to, like, the well of all sparks. The Matrix, when it was considered, like, you know, uh, more of a, a spiritual concept than a physical object. And remember, that was never really a thing. Optimus Primal was never, like, the leader of all Maximals. He was the leader of that mission. You know, there was an entire council of elders that outranked him. So, the, to turn around and go, yes, you are the Optimus. So you have, like, the Matrix within you. You could write that in as, like, his Matrix bond, like, his spark bonded to the Matrix when he combined it with Opt G1 Primes. Maybe. But, no, we didn't have the Oracle. We had Oracom, who downloaded info into Optimus, uh, which gives him, like, the, the visions, the head trips that we're familiar with in Beast Machines. It doesn't mention reformatting at all in this one um it does mention that uh the original transformers had to learn how to transform so it was a training exercise a ceremony of transformation if the maximals want to transform again they're going to have to learn the secrets of the past so there's your seeds of the future lying buried in the past um it they kind of go with this route they very much fast track it in season one beast beast machines uh with the exception of rat trap this Mm. I, I don't like I don't like this idea. For, well, for one, it says the when the first robots came to Cybertron, that's not how it works. We're you know remember it's based on G1 cartoon canon where they were built on Cybertron because Cybertron's a big factory. So that's a little bit off. That's a little bit off. Um, it does mention that. Uh, it does mention that Optimus goes through some kind of physical change, but the only thing it mentions is that his eye sock, his eyes now look more organic. They have pupils rather than the robotic lenses, which I don't agree with that being like, oh, well, now he can emote better, which is mentioned here. I don't think that's necessarily true. Let's see. Um, yeah, so we, we also have uh, a lot of things that are fairly similar. It's Black Arachnia being torn between saving Cybertron and saving and her feelings for Skybolt. Uh, because, again, that may have been Silverbolt at the time. They were back and forth. Uh, we have Rattrap, who 
really just kind of wants to abandon Cybertron, which doesn't feel like Rat Trap at all. Like, he always kind of wants to just kind of go with the easy route, but that doesn't seem like his thing. Uh, Megatron is desperate for the Matrix to all Transformers, which exists within Optimus. With it, Megatron can tap into the original essence that created the Transformers and give him untold power. Definitely did not make its way into the origi- into into the final draft. Again, we know Optimus is not Matrix bonded until after the Oracle reformats him, and then even then, it's through the Oracle and the AllSpark. So he doesn't really have access to the Matrix like this claims. We also have a lot of mentions in this script of Black Arachnia's feelings towards one of the Viacons actually giving them suspicion about her loyalties. So they're going to push the whole, like, former Predacon angle a lot harder than they did in Season 3. I'm glad they didn't. I'm glad she was just one of the Maximals and everyone just kind of trusted her. It, it helps. Yeah, and they're really going to push the love triangle, too. We can have, yeah, there's a whole paragraph dedicated to uh, just Cheetor still being in love with Black Arachnia. Alright, um, I'm reading through quick to find all of the, uh, all the pertinent details. Okay. So, here, here, like, we're in page six. We're in the middle of this concept treatment, by the way. We're in the middle of this, and only here does it actually mention, uh... They actually mention here, Optimus's leader says they have no choice. Um, here, let's go back up further a little bit. Uh, let's see. Uh, let's see. Re- all ridiculous. And this is this is all going into being reformatted. So the reformatting was actually part of this. It didn't seem like there was much of a rush to it, though. Uh, <laughs> since it took this long to actually mention it. Keep in mind, it's been describing an entire season's worth of stories and events, not just see episode one, where this kind of would have made sense. But the Oracle does reformat everybody, and it does mention that they have hand-to-hand weapons they would have to use rather than their old long-distance blasters. Uh, also, as they relearn the art of transformation, their weapons will change with them. The more they learn, the more powerful they will become. Uh, that is not something that happened in the series. Everyone just kind of had their particular tools of toolbox of skills, and it was really only the very end when they got a spark power up did they actually show any more signs of doing anything more powerful. It's unfortunate because uh, it definitely looks like they had some fun concepts with it, but they never really got as far as they should have. You know, Black Arachnia, they Black Arachnia pretty much just threw the exact same webs and like electro shocks the entire series. To the point where it's kind of getting exhausting watching her just use the same attack over and over and over. That one guy in Street Fighter who won't just stop throwing fireballs and fight me like a man. Not that I'm, uh, not, not that I'm, uh, venting or anything. Um, it does go through a lot of, uh, see. yeah, it does go through a lot of, uh, jumps and jumps here. There is a little bit of, uh, there is there is a little bit of that love triangle going through. It mentions, uh, like it does mention, uh, Black Arachnia actually does end up joining the Predacons, but it is an undercover situation. She is still working for the Maximals. It puts her at odds with Cheetor, uh, who almost ends up killing her. So that, so keep in mind, this story mentions that they wanted to still contain the lighthearted humor of Beast Wars, but we have this point where someone, where Cheetor, in love with Black Arachnia, is potentially being forced to kill her because she's a traitor. That's a really heavy story. That's a really heavy story. So yeah, there's a lot of weird changes like that. There's a lot of weird changes through this. Uh, yeah, like, you just keep scrolling through, and it just keeps getting weirder and weirder. I'm gonna let you go and read this for yourself, um, for the most part. It's on TF Raw. It's, it's a retweeted on TF Raw's Twitter account, which is, uh, at Walrus Law. Yes, Walrus is in the sea animal, and Law, as, you know, as if a, as if a walrus became a lawyer. Uh, and we'll, we'll just go through a few other fun mentions here, all right? So things like Megatron wanting the 
uh, the origin of Transformers power because he wants that life creating power uh, in order to create endless transforming armies under his control. Uh, there's a mention of the Great Odyssey. <laughs> so, like, uh, this big, big prophetic thing going on. So, if we go to the final battle of Season 1, the you know, just before we get to the character summaries. So, here we go. Uh, let's see. Um, Optimus learns the Megatron's plan. He's learned the Optimus Matrix can help tap into, uh, let's see. Oh, right, 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 right. We need to, We need this part first. Uh, so Megatron returns to Cybertron, so he's left at some point, uh, to unleash his weapon before it is completed. He knows that once he defeats Optimus, he'll have control of the Matrix he needs to complete his plans. He literally opens Cybertron to reveal great mechanical pods filled with thousands of Transformers. This is where the Maximals were hidden. So they didn't have their sparks ripped out in this one and their bodies destroyed. All the survivors were captured and implanted into, uh, into these pods that he was basically using his batteries. Someone saw the Matrix! Now that I think of it, I can't even remember if Beast Machines or the Matrix came first. It's been a day. I've got a, I feel like I've got a hurricane off my coast. It's been stressful. Tens of thousands of sparks now give Megatron almost unlimited power. But even that's en not enough. He needs the Matrix. And now he, and he, know, he now knows it will soon be his. So... The Season 2 Climax, where Megatron takes all this power from all the Sparks of Cybertron, it was going to be the Season 1 Cliffhanger. Let's see, Megatron, Optimus learns the plan, uh, learns, you know, believes that this is the Great Odyssey, uh, has to take the Transformers back to their beginnings to rediscover the essence that created them. Optimus believes now understands his calling. While on Cybertron, the, or the Oricom says, if Optimus achieves what he intends, it will mean the end of everything. So even though the Oricom set Optimus on this path, apparently this is an apocalypse in and of itself. That's vague. Uh, the Great Battle begins. Optimus realizes his troops can't win against Megatron's might. His, weapons, his weapon is simply too powerful. Optimus and his crew lose the war. The Transformers are placed into the Great Stasis pods and become part of, the, of Megatron's machines. At the same time, Megatron takes Optimus's Matrix, puts it into his Great Machine, and powers up the engines. Megatron's evil inf infuses with the power. The dimensional veil opens. The or the origin. Uh, bleh. I've been reading too long. The origin. The original essence is discovered. Megatron aims his weapon at it to control it to make it his own. At long last, everything he has worked for is his. Megatron is victorious. And on that note, we end Season 4. That seems like a fairly hopeless situation. I'm not entirely sure how you get out of this one. And I don't think the writers did either, because they didn't go with this. So, it, it there's a lot of familiarity here, but oh my god, there's so many differences that didn't make it into the final version. It's fascinating to see just, like, how far it came. And I'm not even sure if I like this treatment better than what we got or not. Because it carries through some of the same problems, but at the same time, it avoids others. And in some ways, it gets even more extreme with its intentions than Beast Machines ended up doing. I don't know. Stuff like this is a fascinating read to me. Like you said, like I said, TF Raw's uh, Twitter account does have it. It's just available to download if you want to read it for yourself. This is not the only document. We have an entire series Bible, as well as a rough draft of Season 2. Oh, and the rough draft of Season 2 is fun. We will definitely be getting into that at some point. But for now, thank you guys for watching. A little bit more Transformers history for you. Um, I hope you appreciate it. I hope you enjoyed. Until next time. I'm like, I think you guys got this. I will back away, and I will see you all later. You've got this handled. <laughs> Alafi's like, really? You're not gonna help me? Like, it's fine now. It's like, these disgusting <laughs> creatures breathing down my neck, and you're all just like, I believe in you, you got this. Alright, you seem He's... to have this. I'm <laughs> <laughs>